Welcome to episode 76 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a head gardener and this is the story of my week in the gardens. This week's story is being recorded on a foul, windy and rainy night after a day of beautiful, brilliant and warming sunshine, which tells me we are in that transitory stage. Spring is on the way. We can now spend the days wandering around looking at the little star-like anemone flowers and spend the nights shivering and wringing out our socks. We should cherish these moments, for they are all too brief. Before long we will be talking about how hard baked the ground is and how sunburned our nose is. So, until then, enjoy this dispatch from the soggy, sloppy rain. I'm talking about planting a very ancient-looking pine tree and the techniques I've used to make it look even older and more craggy than it was. I'm talking about a green Othiopogum and how it's slightly disappointing me, but my hopes for its future... I'm talking about greenhouse cleaning, using grass as, as more of a decorative element, plain old lawn grass. I'm talking about rose stems and the beauty that comes from just looking at them. It's all together a very exciting end of winter, beginning of spring collection of words. So let's get on and, and start listening to The Week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening, a week that began under heavy, dark and ominous cloud and ended with the man who was in to clean the greenhouse telling me that he wished it weren't so sunny. I think he must have been the only man in England wishing away that brief afternoon of sunlight. It's the only day, the only day in 2020 where the sun has come out for any considerable period and he was moaning and muttering and mithering on about how the sun leaves dried water spots on the inside of, of the greenhouse. When he told me that I was thinking, dried? I haven't heard of anything being dried since 2019. Here we don't dry things, we just get wetter and wetter and more and more sodden. We will talk later about those those glorious hours of sunshine, but first, let's talk about Monday and those bleak, oppressive clouds. I'm not normally one to feel personally aggrieved by the weather. I think it's being outside all the time. You take the rough with the smooth. Some people of my acquaintance, I shan't name them, get very upset if their cherished precious weekend time is taken over by a bit of rain or hurricane or gale or sleet because they've spent all week inside thinking about picnics and open air operas and pub gardens and then this is cruelly taken away from them and it almost seems like there is someone up there ordering things to, to punish them for, for something or other. I don't tend to feel that way but after two months of just seeing the the underbelly of the great cloud beast. I have been thinking, can't I just be allowed to see some distance? I want to see, I want to see atmosphere. I want to see the cosmos a little bit. I want to see the moon out in the day or, or that big old sun or some stars or anything that isn't dark, damp and leaden grey. The Monday clouds actually were quite good. They were broiling, broiling clouds. Clouds that looked like waves of smoke going over the ceiling of a room that's that's caught fire. At school we used to be shown these information videos of the deadly dangers of, of chip pans. And chip pans would inevitably lead to, to smoke running up the wall of your house and across the ceiling towards you. That's what Monday's clouds looked like. And I wandered below those impressive formations, looking at the shoots of roses 
mainly. Rose shoot gazing is something that I can lose many hours in which I should be productive. I have a, a very small addiction to it. Actually, it's probably quite a big addiction, but the, the, the hit that I get from each indulgence in the addiction is very small. It's kind of an addiction like, like a phone addiction where people get addicted to notifications and likes. And seeing each one gives a tiny transitory ping of joy that actually, in the grand scheme of things, matters nothing and is, is forgotten. All it does is, is desensitize one a little bit to, to joy in general and diminish the reserves of patience for joyless moments by, by making them all readily available. So I can waste a morning just wandering from one rose to another, from a climber to a rambling rose to, to, to the shrub roses, just checking to see how the shoots are doing. And if they have grown at all, or even if they haven't, it gives me that same sense of, of checking the cricket scores, a moment easily forgotten, but of, of temporary pleasure. I managed to snap myself out of this wandering daze by coming across some shoots that had been badly eaten by squirrels. It's a very annoying thing. I planted a couple of years ago Rambling Rector to run up the side of a black poplar. I've talked about it before in this programme, and I talked about it when I planted it in terms of awe at the, the, the thing that I had unleashed upon the garden, as if I had willingly opened a Pandora's box. All my gardening career I've been hearing the tales of Rambling Rector, the rose that will swallow a village, Rambling Rector, the, the rose that brought down an empire. But my Rambling Rector has been a, a weedy little clergyman and hasn't done very much. It's thrown out quite thin little bits of growth each year and I'm now tying them around the stem of a poplar. I'm not tying them completely horizontally like you would see the, the hoops on a rugby sock. I'm tying them up helter-skelter style, like the, the decorative poles outside a barber shop. And from the, these upward spiralling bits of growth, the, the new canes are going to rush out and flower up. Or they would, had the squirrels not come along, found them pinned to their tree, and eaten every little bit of new growth. This is not a problem that I had encountered before because normally the, the fresh growth on a rose is on wood too fragile to support the body of a greedy and unwelcome little rodent. But when they are, when they are pinned to the bark, they make a, a fantastic buffet. It is as if I had returned home and found a side of salmon nailed to my front door. I would have gone, well, jolly good, I'll, I'll have that. And so the squirrels have done, which is which is a pain because I was so looking forward to seeing it finally column the the poplar in white as it had in in my head so many times. It's a truism in gardening that the best displays are often happy accidents, but I think that people neglect to mention that those those happy accidents are equally matched, if not vastly outweighed, by all of the the planned fate accompli that, that never quite occur. And this rambling rector, it looks like this year, will, will be another example of this. Never mind, there is more in the garden than this one rose. I did do some gardening on Monday. I planted some ferns. Planted them from boards, of course, because everything is far too wet and sloppy to, to stand on. You, you use a board to plant on or to do anything really in a garden when the soil is vulnerable to compression, which is always really. The best practice would be to do to most work if you're on a lawn or in a bed and you can from a board. I don't tend to, I tend to try and, and pretend I'm much more twinkle-toed than I am and tiptoe about, but there was no getting away from the fact that this was board weather. So I, I got the boards out, planted some ferns, and then went home for, for long, hot showers. On Tuesday, I did some much more exciting planting. I planted a vast Scots pine, and this is undoubtedly the most tree I have ever bought per pound of currency. 
It cost me £275 for a tree that is probably 12 foot tall and full of thickness and vigour and gnarling on the, the stem. It's already developing those, those plates that old pine trees do, those, those craggy protuberances. The reason it's so cheap is that it's a second-hand tree. Someone had already bought it and seen it, had it delivered to them, and then realised, oh goodness, this is either far too big or too bent, or not bent enough, and send it back. The reason it might be not bent enough and it might be too bent is that it has quite an attractive kink in it. When I saw it on the, the second-hand section of this nursery's website, what attracted me to it was the fact that it went slightly diagonally upwards for about a third of its further its growth and then kinked. And either the person who was buying their Scots pine wanted a straight Scots pine and got this and, and thought, what the heck, this is just not the ticket. Or the person who bought it wanted a kink tree and got this slightly kink tree and thought, what the heck? This is not the ticket. Either way, they, they send it back. I saw the slight kink and pounced upon it. And it got delivered in a, in a vast tub, a tub that a family could easily bathe in. A little jacuzzi for, for a small family. And I dug a massive hole for it with a digger and then chainsawed the pot to pieces. It's very exciting. It's a really effective way to, to get a tree out. Chainsawed the pot into little sections so that it just stood on, on a disc at the bottom and then slid it off the disc down into the hole. Bob's your uncle had the little wiggly kink arranged almost perfectly with the rock behind. The way they grow these things with a kink in it, it's quite a deliberate technique on the part of pine growers because they know that it adds character to a tree. So what you do is you grow it in a field for, for several years, nice and straight, and then you hike it out of the field and put it into the vast jacuzzi pot from which I cut it. But you put it in, leaning out at an angle. The sort of angle that a stunned bystander who's just seen Superman flying overhead would, would point up at. Not quite directly upwards, he'd point, he'd point, whoa, look, it's Superman. That sort of not quite straight in the air angle. And then once it's grown at that angle for another three or four years, you, you come out with quite an effective kink about the third of the way up the tree. This was useful for me because I was using the tree as a, an aging device to give an instant air of venerability to what was a very, very new rock that we had put in place, an obelisk-style sentinel rock. It's the, the landscaping equivalent of a 16 or 17-year-old going into the pub with a copy of the, the Financial Times and ostentatiously checking on his portfolio in order to con the barman into giving him four or five pints of lager. And that's what I'm doing with this tree, giving, giving the rock its fake ID. Once it's in the ground, its skirt of, of branches and, and pine needles was almost touching the ground. And I thought that really wasn't on, because when one buys a mature pine, one buys it for the trunk, not the needles. The needles are glorious, they're, they're fantastic, but you can see them elsewhere. To, to show how, how big the tree is, you need to see a little bit of that that orangey, russety, lumpy trunk. So I took off the, the lower few whorls so that we see that trunk coming up to the point where it bends. And I also took off the, the leader, very, very top, just so I can bush it out a little bit and so it doesn't run off all tall and scraggy. I wanted to broaden out to grow like a like a big bearded underground mining dwarf, not, not a tall, slender, above ground, air hostess. Overall the effect was was very good. It certainly achieved my aim of making the the tree and the rock look like they had been growing together for generations and they gave a sort of justified venerable air to to the whole section where it could have looked sort of upstart and, and garish 
and sort of arriviste, which we don't want. You have to make it look like it's been there forever. It's the, what, this old thing um, way of responding to a compliment. Things are better if they have apparently generated themselves with no effort on behalf of the gardener. On Wednesday, I was getting involved with more rocks. I was planting an artificial rock bank, or a scree, really. Some very steep, rocky bit that we've built in shade with a big yew hedge on top. And it's quite a strange area of the garden. It's very shaded, and it doesn't really have a purpose beyond being a, a, an avenue to get from one place to the other. It's a canyon, almost. I planted it up with Ophiopogon planiscapus, mainly. And most people will know this particular little evergreen grass from the cultivar nigrescens, which is a very, very dark, black leaf grass. I know that in America it's called the black mondo grass. Not many people know that that cultivar comes from a plain green form, which is nice and evergreen and spreading like the other thing. It will live absolutely anywhere, in, in sun and in shade. And it doesn't tend to get lost amongst the rock work like the black form does. So I put a lot of that down. I was hoping that the effect would be lovely and fresh and, and dark green. And it would feel not necessarily moss-like, but it would feel like something something dripping something that had formed from an abundance of of water and shade some sort of ferny frondy gully somewhere it hasn't really worked so far because this is the time of year when all of these types of grasses look absolutely at their worst they're evergreen but the leaves they have out at the moment have now been out for 11 and a half months and they're starting to look a bit yellow and raggedy we have quite a lot of Rinecchia in the garden, another of those shade-loving evergreen grasses. And it looks really awful and ropey because it's yellowing, it's going up at the tip, and the new grasses are there in a spike, in one of those wonderful hosta-like emerging spikes, or more like maybe like a lily of the valley type spike, ready to come up and unfurl, but not quite there yet. It's slightly frustrating characteristic of the, the spreading type grasses. Funnily enough, the, the Carexes don't do it. Carex seems to look quite good all year round, even in the very, very deep shade. Maybe I should have used one of the nicer of those Carexes, one of the nicer variegated forms. The ones that are variegated between two forms of green, not between between white and and green. Anyway, I didn't. I used the, the Ophiopogum, and I think it will look wonderful once it's greened up and bulked out. Amongst that I've got heather, just plain old winter flowering heather, which can take quite a bit of shade, believe it or not. Mainly it's there for a ping and a pop at this time of year, and also there because it's a newly planted area. And as a, as a tip for all of you professional gardeners, we know that, that our best work is done when a border has had two years, three years, four years to settle in, when the plant communities have established, meshed together, bulked out and started to look brilliant. But you are not paid in three or four years' time. Your work needs to look good instantly. And so sometimes it's worth having a, a matrix that will come good and will satisfy the horticultural purist in you but also having some showy flim flammy razzmatazzy stuff on top that will probably fade out in two or three years time by which point no one will care because your masterwork will be on show we do this all the time with, with annuals. We do it all the time with bulbs. People plant bulbs as annuals so, so why not do it with some, some little bits of heather I once worked for a client who thought that heathers were mobile because they wanted them throughout this woodland and plant them through the woodland and they do look good for, for a year and sometimes a little bit in the second year and then they obviously all disappear, they get shaded out apart from the ones at the very edge, the ring around the woodland 
where they survive and carry on flowering and actually look very good. Which leads naturally to, to the assumption that all the heathers from the inside of the woods have, have slowly moved to the edge of the woods, which is why they're no longer to be found internally and why they're all flowering so happily on the edge. So there you go, Erica, the mobile sun seeker. I think that heather is due for a comeback. And I say that with a uh, slight hesitation because it is said by every single gardening commentator in the country every single year. I think it's been said by, by me for the last 10 years, by everyone I've read, and by probably all those people I haven't read. And the reason people say it is because Heather Nether went away. It's such a brilliant plant. In February, it cannot be beaten for, for colour and excitement and the lure it provides to those early pollinators. Of course it couldn't go out of fashion. What did go out of fashion was the, the heather garden with the stone chip mulch and a couple of horizontal junipers. But the heather didn't go out of fashion. That's like saying that hair went out of fashion because you didn't like the, the perm. Or saying that clothes have gone out of fashion because you don't like crop tops. It's not true. It took a good part of the day, and it still wasn't popping enough, so we went out and got some little tete -tet daffodils in pots, potted up, ready to flower, and stuck them in there for that extra ping, client-pleasing factor. It isn't the best way to buy daffodils, because you end up paying for the compost and paying for the people who've stored them in a, in a glass house and got them going, but... Sometimes planting daffodils in flower like this is quite a neat way to, to add to a spring border that's slightly lacking. And they don't seem to do badly at all. I've got some that we planted in this state in one of the beds that have been merrily going away for, for three years now. And they look identical to any that I had planted in the orthodox bulb style in the autumn. So don't be afraid to go out now and, and buy some spring flowering bulbs at horrible prices from the garden centre. We finished the bank off with a nice little mulch of very well rotted bark and went home pleased with what we had done. It is nice to, to complete an area like that, to turn something that had been completely ignored and wasn't really worthy of time, not really worthy of anyone even thinking about, to turn it into almost a feature to, to see people standing in the canyon and admiring the heather and Othiopogum clad banks was really quite special. And that's what we gardeners are here for, to bring magic and joy to the lives of the civilian population. We aim only to please. On Thursday, I was pleasing myself a bit more. <laughs> I, was, I was in the garden library. I was in the archives, looking at some garden history, back in the Metropolitan Archives, digging into the goings-on of the early 1890s. It's quite exciting. I was looking at the, the documents submitted to the London County Council. Most of them are quite tedious. They are sort of prosecution notes for people who've broken park bylaws, cycling with furious intent, that kind of thing. But they're also wonderfully begging, soliciting adverts from ridiculous companies who have invented a, a steam-powered seesaw or a, a roller coaster crossed with a pergola where you can sit and whiz through the clematis and admire the the roses from from a, a rail beneath this pergola. Wonderful, wonderful things. Unfortunately, I don't think they'll make it into my dissertation, but for someone else out there, they are waiting for you in the in the archives. Just send me a little email at the garden log podcast at gmail dot com and I will send you the catalogue number so you can find them for yourselves. And then back, back to the garden on Friday for that long-awaited day of sunshine. Nemesis of the greenhouse cleaner. Joy of the horticulturalist. It was wonderful to see the crocuses all open. You forget how big and starry their flowers are. I have been wondering 
earlier in the week and the week before, if they would ever have a chance to open. And if they didn't open and no pollinators found them, would they have stayed as those little pent-up purple rockets until June or July and been out at the same time as the oriental lilies? We will never know because open they did and flocks of bees and flies and other pollinating little things that buzz came rushing over to them and, and flopped about collecting the, the little saffrony bits of pollen. It was marvellous to see, remarkable that anyone did any gardening whatsoever because you just want to watch the garden in the light. We did do some work. The greenhouse being cleaned meant moving in and out the bananas and other bits and pieces of tender stuff, some of the canners that we've kept going over the winter. I reseeded some of the lawn in the shade. And it is a very shady area. I don't think the seed will, will last long in there, but I really want it to just come up fresh and green and carpety, even if it's going to be just for a couple of months. This is more of using grass as an annual I just want the freshness, just for a little bit in this bit of time. We've got a month until the beach canopy opens up above and the grass can get going then. And it really is a magnificent ground cover. The, the old lawn grass is the most effective ground cover going. I've been using it a little bit more in the garden as as a ground cover. Well, thinking of it as a ground cover, not necessarily as a, as a carpet to pull up next to the bed, but as something to interact with the bed. I've been going for, for a little look in certain areas that is more of the sort of imagined summer of, of youth. It doesn't matter whose youth, whether that youth happened to be in the in the forties, in the in the fifties, in the seventies, in the nineties. Everyone's countryside imaginings of youth have, have long grass and, and flowering things and, and gates with garden plants growing up against them and a and a skirt of, of green below. And that's the kind of effect that I want to go for. I, I've started doing it using Flomis tuberosa amazon, which is that, that wonderful Jerusalem sage, the purple flowered Flomis, not the not the, the wonderful yellow one, but the the much more elegant lilac purple one. And I've planted cut out little circles in the grass and planted two litre perennials all dotted about. And they will grow up fairly high and I'll keep the circles clear with a bit of mulch and a bit of weeding. But you won't really see the circles from above because you'll see them from the side, and it will just look like the flomus is rising from some shaggy grass, and there's a, there's a rustic uh, split paling fence behind it, and it's going to look a little bit like one of those Chelsea Flower Show installations where someone has just frozen a moment of the school summer holidays uh, and posted it off to, to South London. That's the idea, anyway. The area that I'm sowing with grass is the area where we planted those 100 or 150 plug plant primulas in the autumn. And they look magnificent now. They really do look natural, as if they, they came to rest there. I think it's because, if you remember, I planted them twice. I scattered them about naturalistically and then planted them all into the ground and then blew them all away with a leaf blower and had to plant them again. And I think that double naturalizing has made for a much more effective natural air. Sometimes I have done that with the podcast. As you might guess, this podcast isn't scripted. It is, it is just said. But sometimes I have an idea of what I'll say in advance. And occasionally I've recorded a whole podcast and realized that I've done a setting wrong or the computer's gone clicky in the middle or something, which means that you re-record the whole thing thinking, Did I, didn't I say something quite amusing there? Or I'll, I'll try and do that. And the second time around, it's normally better. Unfortunately, this is this is the first time off the top of my head podcast, so apologies for that. Anyway, the grass area that I am sowing is is the, the area with the premium is in, and the grass is going to come up temporarily after the bluebells have come out, after all of the anemones have done their thing. And if it fades away later in the year, it fades away later in the year. This is an embracing of the transitory. And if nothing else... All the pigeons will get a little bit fatter. Once the last of the seed had been broadcast, 
it was time to pop the bananas back in the greenhouse to shut things up and to say goodbye to another week in the garden. It had quite a nice narrative feel to it, starting as it did so dark and ominous and ending so bright and clear and joyful. It really did feel like a hinge week, a week in which everything changes and we start careering on through the year. I almost get the feeling that I won't be able to spend the majority of next week just looking at buds and seeing if they've grown half a millimetre. I'll have to be chasing after gardens and gardening and then suddenly it'll be October and, and where will it all have gone? Anyway, enough of that. Let's see if I have any recommendations for you this week. No recommendations this week. Instead, a very brief thank you. Thank you to whoever sent me a book this week. I have been sent John Reader's The Untold History of the Potato, about which the Daily Telegraph says, traversing imperialism, politics, technology and diet, Reader's elegantly written discursive book weaves the progress of centuries and continents together in the story of the potato's ascendancy. It really does look like a very good book. It's over 300 pages of very, very small text, dense footnotes, scholarly stuff. So that will be my my holiday reading this year. The potato is coming with me for sure. Thank you very much. I don't know who that was, but, um, but I'm sure it is one of you out there somewhere. I know it's still a soggy underfoot in UK gardenings. But now is the time to start getting out, thinking about things, going into your garden and planning and fantasizing. And if not doing anything so productive, then just go and have a look at a bud somewhere and then go back the next day and see if it's grown a bit. And then suddenly you're on the way to to an addiction to, to rose measuring. My cup of tea has just been finished, so it is probably time for me to go and put the kettle on and have another one, and I will leave you until the next time by saying thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful week, whether you are in the garden or out of it. Cheerio and goodbye. <laughs>